Good evening. My name is Nairi Wood. I'm Dean of the Blavatni School of Government. And a huge welcome to you all, both here in this classroom here at the school, but also to all those of you who are online joining us this evening. Um, as a part of Oxford University, we take our duty very seriously to be building knowledge, but also to be and not, not just storing it, but making it available to society, to people, um, to those around us when the need arises. And it's a great um, privilege to be able to bring these experts together. This is the second panel that we've hosted on, uh, on Ukraine. And if you missed the first, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. And there'll be a third panel next week on the economic consequences. Um, I'm delighted this evening to have five experts here. Um, and we are also joined possibly online, um, but possibly not yet, by one of our alumni, uh, alumni who is sitting in a bomb shelter in West Ukraine, where she's taking refuge. And I, I did just want to, um, with her permission, which she's already given me, to quote um, from a message that Oksana sent me this morning. So Oksana Matyash is uh, a Ukrainian alumna who went, back, who went straight back to Ukraine after finishing the MPP to build Teach for Ukraine. Tragically, a 21-year-old teacher she recruited to Teach for Ukraine was killed last week or in the last few days. And Oksana writes the following, and I just wanted to start this evening by reading you her words. I'm now staying in Western Ukraine where I'm originally from. It's not safe here either, as Russia has launched missiles targeting strategic objects in this area too and causing deaths. I've been offered to get evacuated so many times, but I'm not ready yet. I don't want to become a refugee. I don't want to flee my country, and I don't want to lose my country. Also, I'm responsible for 40 people who are in my team here in Ukraine. I cannot let them down. As an organization, we're working on an emergency plan for supporting Ukrainian children and educators on the ground. And I just wanted to underline that and say it has so many echoes here in the school for our community. For Freshta, who had to flee from Afghanistan earlier this year and whose extraordinary organization is still on the ground providing mobile libraries for kids and people who want to read. For, for many others, the list could go on. For our students and alumni from Syria who are still trying to build lives away from their own country, half of whose occupants have been forced in, into refugee status or displacement. So I just wanted to say this reverberates for so many communities and um, Oksana reminds us of the incredibly painful choices for people committed to their communities at times like this. So what we're going to do this evening is I have five um, experts, four with us, and one who has recorded a short clip for us online, so that what we can do this evening is look at the global refugee order and the millions of refugees joining the refugees from other places that I've just referred to, and what this crisis, what this invasion of Ukraine means for what it shows us is working and what it shows us is not working in the global refugee system. I then want to turn to Russia's goals to get a sense of what this looks like for different, from different angles in Russia and what Russia may or may not achieve. And then to move to three different constraints or things that might restrain war. One, the military tactics and success. Two, international law and the possibility of a tribunal that my colleague Dapo is in the midst of trying to create. And three, nuclear deterrence and what all of this means for the nuclear order. It's a lot to cover, but as those of you who were with us last time know, we will romp through it all with time for a couple of questions from you at the end. I'm hugely grateful to these experts for agreeing not just to be here and sit here and to speak, but to each one of them for so carefully curating their ideas. Each one of them could keep us wrapped for two hours on this subject. 
And what I've asked them to do is the impossible, which is to distill it to five minutes um, so that we can cover the ground. And they have been heroic in doing that. Um, so I'm going to start, and I'll introduce each panelist just before they speak so you don't forget who they are. Um, and I'm going to start with Catherine Costello on my left. Catherine is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of International Refugee and Migration here at Oxford University, but currently on special leave at the Hertie School in Berlin. Thank you for being with us in person um, this evening, Catherine. And if you could start by outlining for us what do we know about what's working and what's not in the refugee system? Sure. Thank you, Nairi. It's a great pleasure to be here, notwithstanding uh, the very sobering and somber topic this evening. Um, in the 20 long days since the Russian Federation invaded Ukraine in an unlawful act of aggression, as I'm sure we are all aware, UNHCR has reported a staggering 2,900,000, um, sorry, 969,600 people have fled the country. Um, in the refugee field, there's a tendency amongst NGOs and international organizations to abuse the term unprecedented. Um, but actually, this one is in terms of the scale of number of people fleeing a conflict. Most, as you know, have fled to uh, Poland. And again, it's a staggering figure, one million, over 1,800,000 people. Um, over 400,000 people have fled to Romania. Um, and over 200,000 to Hungary, Slovakia, over 300,000 now to Moldova, um, and indeed 142,000 to the Russian Federation. Um, so this is extraordinary in terms of scale, but also in terms of response. So what I want to discuss is, as Nairi suggested, what seems to be working, or at least uh, to be offering a degree of protection in terms of the ability to flee, border crossing into EU countries, and the offer of temporary protection, which the EU has made. And then discuss what implications that has for the global refugee regime. Um, in terms of the right to leave, I think many of us in particular who study asylum in the global north or in Europe in particular, have become accustomed to treating asylum seeking as entailing inevitably an illegal and dangerous journey to seek protection. So in that respect, this is different. Ukrainians don't need visas to enter the EU or indeed, uh, well, at least Schengen or indeed to Ireland. Um, and that makes a huge difference as does the way the Schengen border code is being implemented at present. Uh, but the right to leave is imperiled. It's extremely difficult to leave Ukraine and getting increasingly so. So I wanted to address that point first of all. There's a lack of humanitarian corridors. Many people in Ukraine are living under siege and the practices such as ceasefires that we would rely on, that civilians would rely on to leave conflict zones um, are simply not in place. And indeed, there are already very disturbing accounts about um, simply you know, civilians under fire when they thought they had a ceasefire or were able to leave um, areas under siege via humanitarian corridors. Um, Ukrainian men cannot leave, uh, at least those of fighting age, which is deemed to be from 18 to 60 years old. And this too is an extraordinary measure, and many may think it was justified, um, but it is an extraordinary restriction on the human right to leave any country, including one's own. Nonetheless, many are fleeing and many are safely crossing into the EU. While the EU's asylum policies are generally synonymous with attempts to contain refugees elsewhere, on this occasion, there is no elsewhere. People are fleeing directly from Ukraine into Poland, and that proximity is really legally as well as ethically significant. The EU member states are the countries of first asylum. As I mentioned, Ukrainians don't currently need visas to enter the EU, and the European Commission published guidelines about flexibility on Schengen borders, which in effect have meant that although there have been difficulties for many people who've been fleeing Ukraine, and in particular people of color who um, have had very serious practical problems leaving the country, nonetheless, we have had extraordinary scenes of these very large numbers of people safely leaving and entering the EU. At the same time, we know that Europe's borders differentiate, often in very dangerous and discriminatory ways. Only a few weeks ago, if you had asked me about refugees and Poland's borders, I would have been talking about pushbacks of protection seekers from Afghanistan, from Syria, 
who had been framed by the EU itself as a hybrid attack on EU territory because of the fact that Belarus and Lukashenko had orchestrated visas for these protection seekers and then simply sort of pushed them towards the EU's borders. And those practices, as I understand it, the best evidence suggests that those practices of dangerous pushbacks and protection seekers simply you know, waiting in the woodlands to try to enter EU territory have not gone away. So that differentiation, which for many is a very striking discrimination, uh, still persists. But the really striking, uh, I suppose, um, move which the EU made, which I think really genuinely surprised everybody, all observers, was the decision to offer Ukrainians a status of temporary protection when they enter the EU. Temporary protection is a distinctive legal status that has been on the EU statute books since 2001 um, and never used. In fact, never even seriously debated by European political institutions, uh, not in 2015. Um, uh, and the academics who've been bravely studying and writing about this dormant legal instrument now find that their legal expertise is very useful because unanimously um, on the 4th of March, the, um, just gone, the EU member states decided to trigger this legal instrument, which applies not only to all Ukrainian nationals who leave Ukraine, but many uh, foreigners who were refugees there or who had permanent resident status. It still leaves a question mark around the status of you know, the 70,000 foreign students who are in Ukraine and many others who fled Ukraine who may have been stateless or undocumented. But nonetheless, this is a remarkable offer of a secure but temporary status. So for three years, Ukrainians do not need to decide if they are refugees. Asylum authorities don't get involved in examining their claims or their credibility. All of that is avoided. They have a right to work, a right to welfare, and their children have an immediate right to attend school. And it's really working. So the question is, what then? After three years, refugeehood, return, something else. And so these are my final conclusions about what is the likely global refugee regime to emerge. And of course, it's too early to say. For Ukrainians themselves, their fate is tied up with the fate of the invasion. But temporary protection simply forestalls these questions about legality. But to be honest, as a lawyer who studies EU asylum practices, for me, that's a good thing. EU asylum practices produce invidious outcomes. They, just, they end up with situations where, for example, Syrians get different statuses in different countries, end up in protracted appeal situations. Um, there is you know, vast discrepancies in terms of how asylum systems in Europe work. So avoiding that, ideally permanently, in my view, would be a good thing. Um, this kind of group recognition based on a, a presumption of inclusion of the protection needs of people en masse is how refugee systems all over the, work, all over the world tend to work. Um, and so in some ways, these highly judicialized, legalized practices in Europe and in the global north are the outlier. But really more generally, the question isn't about the legalities and questions of status in the longer term, although those will become really urgent and practically important. The question is whether the treatment of Ukrainian displaced persons will remain framed as exceptional because of these questions of scale, affinity, and proximity. What we know from the best scholarship about the global refugee regime is that states and institutions <coughs> always treat different refugees differently. There is always a question about affinity and a question about geopolitics. In a wonderful book last year um, published by Lamis Abdelati, um, she produced a great account of the global refugee regime, which explained why it is that different refugee groups get treated differently. And the question is, given that we know that, that this is a matter of you know, domestic and international political preferences and interests, what do we do about it? So is this Ukrainian case going to remain exceptional or will it become an example of good practice where we can see that banking on refugee agency and particularly on refugee mobility is something that can work for both refugees and for states. And I would say on the one hand, it's very easy to paint a dystopian vision. We can imagine compassion fatigue, backlash, at the moment, we're just 20 days into this situation. Mostly women and children have been fleeing. They're the perfect victims at the moment. 
Um, and maybe these perfect refugees become a pretext for a backlash and further restrictions on others. How do we see the impact of the food insecurity that the sanctions are likely to unleash, in particular in the Middle East, in Lebanon and Turkey, when I think about those countries and their very large Syrian refugee populations, I just really shudder. So that dystopian vision on the one hand, you know, I can see that unfurling. On the other hand, and to conclude an alternative vision, is one where we use this example, which hopefully will continue, in the sense that refugees are moving, they're allowed to choose their place of refuge anywhere within the Schengen area. This is also a remarkable departure from previous practice that mobility works for states and for refugees. And we know from the Syrian experience that containment backfires. Trying to keep refugees at a distance does not work. It just means that smugglers win and refugees lose, as, as do states and democratic societies who are seen to lose control. So the alternative I would suggest, and whether my alternative more positive vision prevails, really depends a lot on what we make of the current situation. The global refugee regime is not just comprised of states, it's comprised of international organizations, volunteer efforts. Um, public opinion on these questions, as we know, is extremely fickle. So how we, universities, for example, play a role is crucially important. But I would suggest the decisive question might end up being, not how Ukrainian refugees are being treated, but how other refugees are, which will include inevitably many refugees from the Russian Federation as well. And that might end up being a real lit litmus test for refugee protection going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That's a terrific start and it takes us you know, very neatly into our next speaker, who's going to look at, um, you know, whose, whose talk might well touch on, on, on the Russian refugees. Carol Leonard is an emeritus fellow at St. Anthony's College. Carol trained as a historian of Russia and taught Russian history before also training as, afterwards, training as an economist and then really building an extraordinary career as a bridge and interpreter between Russia and the West on all things Russian. Carol has spent the last decade as a professor in Moscow and indeed director of the Russian Studies Center at Moscow's Presidential Academy for the National Economy and Public Administration. Carol, we, I think all of us in this room would have a sense of how gut-wrenching this is for you. And I'm really grateful to you being here this evening for telling us, giving us the long view. What, where, where might we end up? What a privilege it is to be here. The last time I saw you was at the Gaidar Forum. We were all thrilled, speaking from the Russian side, that you were there. Uh, it, was one of, it was a great moment. Um, yes, I have spent a long time in Russia. Um, and this is really my first time over the radar um, because I have a lot of friends there. Um, but I'm going to be honest with you how I feel. Um, the long view, will there be a victory and what will it look like ending the Russian invasion? I intend to be five <laughs> minutes uh, um, and no more. The conquest of Ukraine. What will that victory look like? Annexation? Well, it wasn't enough in the case of Crimea. So no, that's not enough. Puppet government? A more likely scenario. But it requires dealing with an insurgency. And according to the army estimates and calculations, you need at least 20 to 25 soldiers per 1,000 people to control an insurgency, and Russia has about four. Compromise with Ukraine, the most likely scenario. A corridor from Donbass to Crimea, leaving a rump state. Alexander Etkin, one of the great experts on Russia, has said, well, it will look like Germany in the Cold War era, with Western Ukraine more dependent on Europe and the eastern part sucked into the Russian sphere of influence. Moving on, since I can't resolve that, the meaning of victory for the Russians. 
to young Russia, let me, in this sphere, simply use the words of Marina Avstyanikova, that editor at Russia's state-run Channel One television station, who broke into its new cast, newscast shouting, stop the war. Now the whole world has turned the back, their back on us. And the next 10 generations, she said, won't wash away the stain of this fratricidal war. Young people mostly feel like that. But the electorate, non-urban, and older people, most Russians support the war. Due to the Russian state's appeal to patriotism, and as we know, Russians are often motivated more by ideas than general hardship that the sanctions will impose. A third area of meaning for me, which goes very deep, science and society. What will it mean to scholars, the loss of their reputation? They are now threatened or alerted to their no longer having to publish in international journals. I recall that this is a very similar situation which struck German scholars. I was talking last night to, with someone who said, yes, the philologists lost their dominance in the field. German journals were no longer read. So Russian scholars, will they lose their credibility? I'm afraid they will. And their place in this very hard-won, competitive, scientific um, world. So the economy, the Russian economy in the short run, and I take some of this from Branko Milanovic, a great authority on inequality. His assumptions, no regime change, current fighting ends in months. So the economic decline, by how much? He observes that in 1917, the economy after that war, the Great War, was 18% of what it had been before the war. Default, GD, default, the clock is ticking. $150 billion in debt. Can they pay it? Their currency has collapsed. So what are the solutions we're looking, looking at coming out of government um, announcements? An indexation of pensions. Well, that's 30% of the population. Um, Income tested larger child benefits. Can they deliver? The institutional weakness of the safety net structure in Russia is clear in the effects of COVID. Um, the large number of registered deaths, some 360,000, and Russian excess deaths may be among the highest in the world. Inflation, low imports, Scarcity, rationing, riots, certainly smuggling, and crime networks will reappear. As Milanovic concludes, his policies stuck the country in an impasse and thus closed off all the news of escape. A victory and the long run. Sanctions can last, as we know. Iran, 40 years. Cuba, 60 years. And the way you escape from backwardness once you've been plunged back, borrow technology. But given sanctions, you can't borrow technology. China, well, import substitutions. And you could shift trade to the east. You could relocate your capital in Vladivostok. 10 hours by flight from Moscow? So your labor resources, can you use them to build, rebuild your industrial uh, structures? No. Russia's population is shrinking and aging and well-educated, not an industrial labor force. So there will be a considerable dependence on Chinese assistance. The conclusions that I would like to draw for you these losses are so substantial 
that it will bring no sense of victory in Russia. A full revival of Cold War military investment is already going on. Deep dissatisfaction in Russia and this tremendous educational and institutional achievement since the 1990s that has been structured by Russian academics, one of the most brilliant universities in the world, the higher school of economics, and the one where I'm associated with the Presidential Academy, with his new liberal college, all English, buried by repression. That's it. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. And I'm sure in our questions, we're going to want to come back to are there in that system you describe with, you know, with a lot of the population you know, being fed the message of nationalism, whether there were restraints in the system? Are there restraints on how far and badly this could go? But let's come, we're going to come back to that. Um, um, so I'd like to move now. So we've had a, a vision of the refugee order of... The, some of the real both economic and demographic constraints on Russia for the long term. And now we're going to just zoom up a little closer and look at the military tactics and strategies slightly more in the short term. And here we have a uh, reappearance from, for those of you who were here last time, of uh, Tom Simpson, our very own uh, faculty member here in the school, who as well as being a very eminent philosopher, served as an officer in the Royal Marine Commandos and thinks deeply about military strategy. So Tom, over to you. How's it looking uh, from where you sit? For those of you who were here two weeks ago, the core idea I tried to set out there was that we're at the start of actually what's likely to be quite a long conflict that's going to unfold. So I'm not going to repeat that. If you're interested, do go and look at the video. What I want to just unpack this evening is some of the volatility and fragility about the current situation. So uh, there seem to me to be unappreciated risks of escalation or not widely appreciated risk, risks of escalation, which from a military perspective need to be thought about because they have political implications. So war is just inherently chaotic. It's inherently uncertain. One person can make a decision to go to war, in this case, Vladimir Putin did. But once done, that sets off a chain of events that have no clearly forecastable consequence. And the world in 1914 did not expect that a shooting, an assassinate, political assassination in the Balkans, would lead to millions of, uh, mil millions of people engaged in conflict across, across Europe at that time. So I don't wish to be alarmist, but I do think there are some risks in the current situation which need to be explored. So, so what are these risks? I just want to turn back first to two very important episodes that we've had in the lead up to the conflict. So the first point is we had about a two-month period where it was very widely reported that there were very significant Russian forces on the borders of Ukraine, advertised intent from Putin. But both the US and UK went on record to say that British and American troops would not be deployed to Ukraine. Okay. So that's really significant. That's an important bit of public communication to the domestic audience. But what it did is it had the effect of giving a green light to Putin to say, here's a threshold beyond which two of your key potential adversaries are not going to go. So there was a space there which we, by our messaging, left open and which Putin decided to escalate into, and the tanks rolled across the border. So that's one episode. The second episode happened more recently. So one of the key bits of equipment that could be supplied to Ukraine is fighter jets. And Ukrainian pilots are trained on uh, Russian-made Soviet-era equipment, MiGs. And the obvious provider for this was Poland, who have some MiGs in, uh, in their arsenal. So the... The thought was, could Poland provide MiGs for the Ukrainian pilots to then fly? Poland was very cautious about that, because if they supply MiGs, it looks like they're becoming 
one step removed from the conflict. They effectively have a border with Russian armed forces because they have a border with Belarus. And they declined to do it. And what they said publicly was, we'll give it to the US, and the US can then choose to supply it to Ukrainian armed forces. And the US declined. Okay? So the US declined because they were worried that this was an escalation too far. So what that did is it set another threshold. It said, NATO has decided that we can't take action at this threshold. So we now do not know what the NATO threshold is which they think they can't act below. But we do know that there is this threshold. Straight after doing so, one of the Russian spokespeople came out and said, and we view the supply of man-portable missile systems, Javelin and Stinger, anti-tank and anti-aircraft, as an escalatory act. Okay. So the Russians were straight in there to try and exploit this, to say, we view this as escalation. So I highlight these two things, because what, what they show is that we've had two instances now where NATO has deliberately pulled back, and into that void, Russia has stepped in an escalatory manner. So here, so here are the, so the dynamic right now. The, the escalatory dynamic is something that Putin has shown that he's willing, he's willing to step forward and do. So here are the two ways in which the conflict has the potential to escalate. So one potential means of escalation is geographic. Um, in particular, Russian armed forces could extend their activity beyond the borders of Ukraine. Four NATO countries have borders with Ukraine, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. Now, my assessment is that this is very unlikely in the current context. Russian war aims are directed at control of Ukraine, if they ever get that far. Um, but that is how far it goes. So I think there are scenarios where there could be temptations for Russia to escalate beyond the border, but those are not current temptations or for the foreseeable future. But we have already seen border escalation by Russian forces. So four days ago, the Ukrainian armed forces reported, were reliant on the Ukrainian armed forces report, but nonetheless they did report that a Russian jet opened, flew into Ukraine and then turned around and then opened fire on a village just on the Belarusian side of the border. And the assessment here was that this was an attempt to goad the Belarusians into believing that Ukrainian armed forces had attacked to then bring about Belarusian engagement in the conflict. Belarus so far has withstood that and probably won't. The second way in which Russia could escalate is in the use of non-conventional weapon systems. And in particular, this is nuclear weapon systems and its chemical weapon systems. And this is a point of real concern for me. And the history here is really important. So Russia used polonium to kill Alexander Litvinenko here in the UK in 2006, if I remember rightly. And they used Novichok, a chemical agent, in Salisbury, in the Salisbury poisonings. The Syrian conflict has also seen the use of, firstly, sarin gas, most publicly in 2013, and then repeated use of chlorine barrel bombs, which is a chemical agent. And this has been described as systematic and widespread. This has been by the Assad regime, but the Assad regime has been operating on the ground in close cooperation with the Russian military, and in particular, uh, Russian, so Russian Air Force and ground forces. And chlorine matters because this was how they broke the siege of Aleppo. So urban warfare is inherently destructive leads to buildings being rubbleized, and the solution for defenders is to go underground so that you're not being hit by this very heavy fire. And we're already seeing this pattern playing out. Chlorine is heavier than air, so by dropping barrel bombs, what you can do is effectively allow the chemical to seep into the underground passageways and kill the defenders there. So you're, they've effectively got nowhere to go. They're either killed in the basements by the chlorine or forced up to then face the artillery fires. So there is the most dangerous situation we face right now is actually not that Russia does well on the battlefield. Potentially the most dangerous situation we face is that Russia does badly on the battlefield. Because in desperate situations, people do desperate things. And so a scenario that needs to be thought about, and there's already evidence that this is being thought about in particular in Washington, is one in which Russia does use chemical weapons in particular. And the scenario is that Russia fails to take Kiev, one of the other major cities, 
and in an attempt to break the deadlock, starts to use chemical weapons or potentially tactical nuclear weapons. And that poses a very profound dilemma for NATO forces at that point. And the dilemma is, do we stick with the current trajectory, which is offer all possible support that we can to Ukraine, but fundamentally not remain engaged in the territory? Or is there a view that this is such a shock to the conscience of humanity, particularly if there's use of tactical nuclear weapons, that this is a line that cannot be withstood and therefore NATO should engage uh, militarily within Ukraine in order to demonstrate that this norm of non-chemical and non-nuclear use is a taboo which absolutely must be protected within the international community. So that's a dilemma that needs to be thought about within NATO. And if within that dilemma there's then a second question, so suppose you think that there are some lines which ought not to be crossed and we should be willing to fight to prevent that. Should we declare that intent right now? So the par the par log deterrence has this paradoxical logic about it, which is that if you threaten to use force, then you may not have to use force. That is the promise of deterrence. And so far, NATO forces, have, NATO politicians, have deliberately refrained from stating red lines, deliberately refrained from threatening force for fear of the colossal gamble that might unfold. And arguably, the consequence has been that we've seen force being used by Russia in ways that no one anticipated or expected. So we have an existing escalatory dynamic. There's clear evidence of that on the Russian side. And the question for military planners and strategists on the NATO side in particular is, are we willing to meet that escalatory dynamic with our own willingness to f use force in the prediction, the estimate, that that will actually have a de-escalatory effect? But these are colossal gambles, and there is colossal amounts at stake in the conflict. Um, so with that, I end. Thank you very much, John. Given that Tom has left uh, off with the nuclear question, I might just go straight to a short pre-recorded clip that we have from Malfred Braut Heghammer, who sadly couldn't join us at this time. Um, Malfred is a Norwegian political scientist and one of the world's most eminent on the nuclear question. Her 2016 book is on why Iraq and Libya failed to build nuclear weapons, but she's written on pretty much every nuclear power or nuclear hopeful and the problem of proliferation and nuclear control around the world. So I wonder if, Jamie, we could show the Malfred's uh, clip now. My answer to this is no, it doesn't. And I'd point to a couple of different reasons uh, for that, both in terms of Ukraine's nuclear history and principles of nuclear strategy and deterrence. Starting with the first points, um, history. Uh, the view uh, implied in the question is increasingly prevalent, but I'd suggest it's not really historically accurate. The nuclear weapons in Ukraine were Soviet nuclear weapons that were effectively controlled from Moscow. In the early 1990s, the Ukrainian government was concerned about giving away these weapons and thereby making Russia the sole nuclear heir of the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal. For this reason, uh, the Ukrainian government uh, wanted security guarantees, which it did not receive. It also proposed a more gradual reduction of nuclear weapons as opposed to transferring them to Russia. Ukraine even took some small steps towards assuming more direct control over the Soviet nuclear weapons in the early 1990s. But it did not receive much support for these uh, suggestions. The United States was worried about uh, nuclear proliferation risks uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was also concerned about the prospect of several nuclear weapon states emerging from the Soviet Union. And so it didn't support these uh, Ukrainian uh, suggestions. 
And so in December 1994, in the now famous, perhaps infamous Budapest Memorandum that was signed by Russia, the United States and the United Kingdom, Ukraine received security assurances and not security guarantees uh, to, um, to ensure its sovereignty and territorial integrity that this would be respected. And second, um, there is something we refer to as the stability instability paradox when it comes to nuclear weapons and deterrence. And this means that states can, as Russia now ha has done, use nuclear weapons as a shield to carry out conventional attacks, precisely because other states are worried about uh, the conflict escalating to a nuclear um, exchange. And so this was a concern historically for NATO and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And more recently, we've seen that uh, two nuclear weapons states, India and Pakistan, have been engaged in clashes, despite them both having nuclear weapons. So it's important to stress that nuclear weapons cannot deter all forms of aggression. And I think that what we've seen uh, in the Ukraine war uh, underscores that problem. And I also think that it's likely that this calls for more conventional forces, um, both in Europe and in Asia, moving forward um, as a result of Russia's nuclear threats. I am concerned, though, that the view implied in the question uh, could be used by some states that are reluctant to give up nuclear weapons. Uh, one example could be North Korea, which has come under pressure to denuclearize, which it is reluctant to do. And I'm concerned that what we've seen now in the Ukraine could be used as an example by, for example, North Korea, and as a reason to not uh, hand over nuclear weapons, which I think ultimately is not the right lesson to draw from this case. Focusing on nuclear weapons and the nuclear dimension of this situation, I think that both of these states see this strategic problem from rather different perspectives. In the wake of the Ukraine war, there is growing concern that China could also use nuclear weapons as a shield um, and launch aggression against Taiwan, for example. Um, as I mentioned in my first answer, India has been at the receiving end of uh, Pakistani aggression in the past, where Pakistan has also used uh, nuclear weapons as a shield. I think we should brace ourselves for the possibility that future regional conflicts in both Europe and Asia could take place in the nuclear shadow. And I also think that the recent signals from NATO um, suggest that this is a problem that states will be increasingly worried about uh, in years to come. So there we, there we have Malfred telling us that the promise of a stable nuclear order is not, does not give anywhere near the stability that, that, that is suggested, that both for the reason that Tom also mentioned, it's not operating as um, a deterrent, rather it's a shield um, from behind which certain kinds of aggression uh, take place. And the prospects, therefore, for, for the nuclear order and for persuading states to give up nuclear weapons have been diminished over this period. Um, let me now move to Dapo Akande, who many of you will recognize from our last panel. In the ensuing two weeks, Professor Dapo Akande, who has been elected to the International Law Commission, has been working very hard with other lawyers to establish a special tribunal for war crimes being committed in Ukraine. So, Dapo, tell us about that. How has the two weeks been? Where are we? And what, what's going to be the impact of the tribunal? OK, so let's... Um First of all, take a step back. So two weeks ago, we were talking, uh, I was talking about the arguments that Russia had put forward to justify its um, use of force in Ukraine, and talking about the role that international law is playing in this conflict, and in particular, the invocations of international law, not only by Russia, but also by other states in their um, actions to try to resist the Russian aggression. 
What I want to focus on today is really this question of accountability for violations of international law. So to what extent might it be possible to have some measure of accountability for these violations? Now, one of the defining changes of in the international legal system since the end of the Second World War is this idea that international law is not just binding on states, but that international law is also binding on individuals, and that international law imposes criminal responsibility on individuals for violations of certain acts that are classified as international crimes. So if you read the judgment of the Nuremberg Tribunal, there's a, there's a quote in there which has, at least in international law circles, become very well known, where the tribunal says this. It says, crimes against international law are committed by men, not by abstract entities, and only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provisions of international law be enforced. And since that point on, in 1946, the international legal system has been trying to build institutions and mechanisms for enforcing international law in this way. In other words, for enforcing international law against individuals and not just against states. So the question that we now face with respect to the actions of Russia in Ukraine is to what extent can international law here be enforced against those individuals in the Russian government and perhaps even those outside the Russian government who are responsible for the acts that we see on our television screens. So we have the International Criminal Court. It's a permanent international court, at least that's the idea, established by a multilateral treaty to prosecute war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. And last week, 40 states, and this was unprecedented, 40 states referred the situation in Ukraine to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who then immediately announced that he was opening an investigation into the situation in Ukraine. So let me first talk about the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court with respect to international crimes in Ukraine. And then I'll turn to this special tribunal that some of us have been working on over the last couple of weeks. So the International Criminal Court is set up by a multilateral treaty. But Russia is not a party to this treaty. Actually, Ukraine is also not a party to this treaty. So on what basis, if any, does the International Criminal Court have jurisdiction to deal with international crimes occurring in Ukraine. The ICC's basis for jurisdiction is premised on the principle that if a crime is committed, an international crime within the meaning of, of that treaty is committed on the territory of a state that has accepted the jurisdiction of the court, then the court has jurisdiction. So in a sense, it's a mechanism by which states can delegate the jurisdiction that they have over things that occur in their territory to this international tribunal. And even though Ukraine is not a party to the statute of the ICC, in 2014, Ukraine issued a declaration in which it accepted the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court with respect to crimes occurring in Ukraine. And that is sufficient for the ICC to exercise jurisdiction over certain international crimes occurring in Ukraine. So I say certain international crimes because under the regime of the ICC, this territorial jurisdiction that I've just described, it works with respect to war crimes, so crimes relating to the conduct of the hostilities. So for example, intentionally attacking civilian, uh, civilians and civilian objects intentionally attacking medical facilities. All of these are war crimes, using weapons which are incapable of making a distinction between civilians and combatants. All of those fall within the jurisdiction of the ICC, as does crimes against humanity. But there is a gap, and it actually 
takes us back to where Catherine started. So Catherine said what we are seeing is an act of aggression being committed on Ukraine. And this is the gap that exists with respect to the jurisdiction of the ICC. Though in principle, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, which is the waging of an unlawful war. So unlawfully using force in breach of the UN Charter, though the ICC in principle has jurisdiction over that crime, the regime, the jurisdictional regime of the ICC with respect to aggression is such that, first of all, the ICC cannot exercise jurisdiction over aggression with respect to um, aggression committed by a non-state party. So that rules out aggression committed by Russia. Secondly, the ICC could exercise jurisdiction over aggression committed by a non-state party if the situation is referred to the ICC by the, the United Nations Security Council. But of course, Russia has the veto in the Security Council, and so that uh, option is also closed off. So the ICC cannot exercise jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. So this is where a number of, of us have proposed the creation of a, a special tribunal to prosecute the crime of aggression against Ukraine. So this would be a tribunal that would be created in one of a, a couple of ways, and that's still under discussion. It could be a tribunal that's created by agreement between Ukraine and a number of states, or alternatively, it could be a tribunal that's created by a treaty that's entered into between Ukraine and the United Nations um, on, on the authorization of, of the UN General Assembly. So why the proposal to create this tribunal? And what good would it do? Or what good might it do? And then thirdly, what are the criticisms? What are the problems with making this proposal? So first of all, the case for having this tribunal. The first one is that it might actually serve an important expressive function. The idea that what is at, the, the, what is at root, the core of the problem that we see with respect to the violation of international law here is not so much how the war is conducted, which is what war crimes and crimes against humanity deals with, but actually the waging of the war in and of itself. So there's another quote from the, the Nuremberg Tribunal where it talks about the crime of aggression, or at that time it was called crimes against peace. It describes it as the supreme international crime in the sense that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. And what they mean by that is that all the evils we see actually arise from the original decision to wage an aggressive war. So that's an expressive function. It's underlining the norm of the prohibition of aggression. But beyond that, in practice, what good might it do? So the gap that exists in relation to the ICC is not just the fact that the ICC, can only, uh, the ICC cannot prosecute the crime of aggression. It's also the fact, that, uh, the fact that to prosecute war crimes, you need to tie specific acts so the bombing of this residential building, the use of this particular type of, of weapon in a particular instance, you need to tie that to particular individuals. And, so, and it's not always easy to make the connection between the acts that occur on the ground to the senior leadership. So if you look at the history of the International Criminal Court, it's been going for about 20 years, with respect to war crimes, there are probably as many acquittals as there, has, as there have been convictions because of the difficulty of prosecuting senior leadership. And the ICC is precisely there to prosecute those who bear the gravest responsibility. It's a bit easier to show the responsibility of those who are on the battlefield, more difficult to show the responsibility of those at the top. The crime of aggression is a leadership crime. So unlike all the other crimes, it only applies to leaders. But in this particular case, it's probably easier actually to establish the responsibility of senior leadership for the waging of the aggressive war than it is to establish responsibility for how the war is fought. 
And the crime of aggression, at least as it exists under customer international law, is not just about those who make the decision, but it's also about those who have a role in shaping or influencing the decision to wage an aggressive war. And so there's a possibility it's hard to see that today, admittedly. I think those of us involved in this are not starry-eyed. There's a possibility that the crime of aggression starts to shape in the same way that we do with sanctions. It starts to shape the thinking of those who are around the regime, those who have a role to play in influencing the regime to think that they are also personally responsible for what is going on. Now, the criticism, and I'll just mention one and I'll stop here. I'm actually going to stop where Catherine stopped because this is very similar to the point that she was making in relation to what we're seeing with the refugee system now in relation to Ukrainian refugees. And it's the charge of selectivity. So why Ukraine? Why do Ukrainian refugees get the temporary protection from the EU when the Syrians don't? And you can make the same case in relation to creating a tribunal to prosecute the crime of aggression in Ukraine. Why didn't we see this, for example, for Iraq? Why haven't we seen it for other tribunals? My response, and I admit that this is an imperfect response, two responses, I would say, is first of all, um, to say that unless we can do everything, we can't do anything, means that we never actually do anything. You always have to start from somewhere. That's the first response. And of course, that's very difficult to say to those who don't get the temporary protection, to those who don't get the, the tribunal. That's the, you know, that's the first response that I would make. The second response that I would make is that though I very much agree that it's important to fight this charge of selectivity, there are real questions about when is the moment to fight it? Do you fight selectivity when people are being accorded temporary protection or when a tribunal is created and you say, no, not for them, no, not now? Or do you fight it in instances when people don't get the protections that you want them to get? I think that's uh, an important thing to think about. Thank that's you nice. hugely, Dapo. And Great work. Um, I see that um, Oksana Matias, and Oksana, I quoted you at the beginning of this seminar, as I warned I might. I see that you've joined us online and that you have probably a lot of questions, if we know you, Oksana. But if you would like to come online and, and um, either make a comment or ask a question, we'd love to see you. Might not be possible from where she is. So a number of you, while we see if we can bring Oksana up, a number of you have asked about what um, might be the end of Putin, as it were. And Ian Taylor asks, you know, he says, Carol, you've depicted a picture of a Russian economy that's very quickly going to dive and a Russian economy that's going to find it very difficult to rebuild because of the demographics you painted to us. Is it nationalism and a... And a, and a and a horror at that that's going to cause people to turn on Putin? Or what? Like, what's, what for you, very, very briefly, we've got 30 seconds left, is the end of Putin? <laughs> <laughs> Easy one. <laughs> um, well, sadly, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't really see the end of Putin yet, do we? Mm. Okay. Um, I think that um, the sanctions are not well targeted, if I can be so bold as to say that. They fall on people who have been fairly independent and not very influential. Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, today, I think the UK actually changed its targets. Will these sanctions create grounds for a coup? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. Can I echo what I read recently in a very major article about the fusion of the Orthodox Church and the FSB, which is the successor to the KGB? And 
this means that the Orthodox Church is being used to symbolize this um, attack on Ukraine. And if the public propaganda is effective, I'm not sure that you can get that majority motivated against Putin. You certainly haven't seen um, protests the way you did in 2011. Does that answer the question at Thank all? Thank you, absolutely. Um, I, I know that time is up. I want to draw out a couple of points that I think we've covered a lot of terrain here. And um, Catherine has, I think, very powerfully reminded us that the litmus test of our refugee system might not be whether we open our homes to Ukrainians. It might be whether that becomes the exception. And the test is how we treat other groups of refugees as well. Um, Carol's pointed out the fratricidal nature of this war, but it's huge long-term cost to Russia and the difficulties of rebuilding afterwards. Tom has pointed out to us the spaces that have been created to Putin. It's a provocation to us to think about what the counterfactuals he's suggesting to us are. Um, Malfred highlighted both the stability and the instability of the nuclear order within which we're living and the powerful question that leaves us about what kind of nuclear, uh, dare I, order or disorder um, we're going to be living in. And DARPO has highlighted not just um, that this tribunal is gathering, there is a gathering head of steam for this tribunal, but also I think for the School of Government, what kind of scholar practitioner action can be taking place behind the scenes when the world is affronting these kinds of problems. Um, I'm sorry that we haven't had more time for Q&A from all of you. I'm going to pass the floor immediately to Oksana, who is now with us on screen. Oksana, we, we began tonight's seminar with your words about not leaving Ukraine, but standing behind the 40 people you employ um, and wanting to, to fight to preserve your country. Over to you. Good evening, everyone. I, I actually joined the conversation at the beginning, but then I had to run to a bomb shelter because the air raid siren went on again. And this is the 15th time just in, in the last 24 hours that I had to hide. So you can imagine, you know, how life is disrupted for, you know, already 35, I think 37 million of people because 3 million of Ukrainians already um, fled. And I'm very grateful to be, you know, to be able to listen to the top minds, you know, about uh, the, the prospects of, you know, ending Russia's invasion uh, in Ukraine. And this is the third week that I've been living in a war. I'm, I'm 29 years old. I'm just one year younger than Ukraine. And I was actually planning to celebrate my, uh, my 30th birthday um, in a peaceful country. And one of the reasons, you know, what I'm staying uh, now in, in Ukraine in my home is because Ukrainians have been standing up to their aggression in, in the way that the world hasn't expected us to, right? And there were so many projections that, you know, Kyiv may fall in three days to the Russian military aggression, but this is the 20th day and we're still standing. And I just, you know, I would like to urge the world just to keep supporting us and keep the pressure on because so many civilian objects have been either destroyed or damaged. We have more than 400 educational institutions either destroyed or damaged. And in order to rebuild one educational institution, it costs on average $15 million uh, to do that. So there's gonna be so much work to do and there has to be somebody to pay for all the damage that has been caused to my country. And I really hope that the international community, including the academic community, will, will stand up to the truth and will keep supporting uh, the people of Ukraine uh, and our fight for freedom. Because this is one of the main reasons that, I keep, that I'm planning to you know, stay on in my country and do as much as possible to support my people. And you know, also to honor the memory of those friends who lost their lives on the third day of the war, which is something that I will never personally be able 
to accept and something that I was not, you know, even ready um, to, to deal with and to live with just three weeks ago when I had to flee my home in Kiev at 6 a.m. in the morning, a European capital. So I, I thank you for, for this opportunity to speak. And I also am extremely grateful to all the support that, you know, Ukrainians and Ukraine has been receiving for the third week in a row. Thank you. Thank you, Oksana. And just before we close tonight, um, Nina Benson, one of this year's Master of Public Policy students, I think on behalf of a group of Master of Public Policy students, would like to say a few words about what some of the students in the school have been doing. Nina. Great. Uh, hi, my name is Nina, um, and I'm just speaking tonight really briefly uh, to share uh, a few words about one of our classmates, Victor, who is currently, uh, so, so four days after the war broke out, he flew to Poland, where his family is from, and has been spending the past two weeks on the Polish-Ukrainian border, helping refugees uh, in Ukraine, as well as in Poland, um, get supplies, get help, uh, medical uh, help, get um, food, whatever sort of uh, things that they need that the big organizations have sort of not been able to supply to all. Um, currently, we're helping people get resettled. So because 1.8 million refugees are in Poland, there's a massive ho housing shortage. So for the past two weeks, we've raised 17,000 pounds, and uh, the money is going straight to helping Ukrainian refugees. And I, around the tables, you'll see a link um, to donate if you have the opportunity. And we also have just a short uh, video from Victor. He was in uh, at the train station in Warsaw today um, helping to resettle a family. So thank you very much if you have the opportunity to support. Hi everyone, this is Victor from the MPP program. Um, I'm sending a quick message here from Warsaw. I'm just standing outside the main train station. Um, I've been here now since the fourth day of the war, so over two weeks. Um, and as many of you know, a group of us in the program are organizing support for Ukrainian refugees on the ground. Basically what that support looks like is doing what the Polish people here are doing, uh, standing up where the government right now is playing catch up. So that means providing supplies to refugees, sending supplies to uh, Ukrainians still in, the, in their country, um, and also providing accommodation to Ukrainian refugees who don't have any other options. Here in Warsaw, all of my family friends have refugees in their homes. And I'm going in there right now to the train station to pick up a family of six and taking them to accommodation that we're using uh, the funds that you're donating to pay for. And so if you're looking to support initiatives on the ground, uh, take a look at ours, but please support Ukraine any way you can. Um, there's a lot of great organizations we can point you to and even your uh, following of the news and what's happening over the coming weeks is extremely important. Thank you very much. Thank you. And can I also just add to what, well, we will applaud them in a second, but I just wanted to add to what Nina said, that it is what their fundraising effort is a model of transparency. They, you can go online when you scan the thing and see exactly how every single penny is being deployed. If only we could get every agency and company everywhere in the world to do the same uh, that would be a great thing. But huge applause to the efforts of the MPP. I, st I started tonight by saying that as a university, we have a, we have a duty to build and store and share knowledge when society needs it. It's wonderful to have you all here in the school this evening. Just before we close, um, can I ask you to turn, to, to speak to the person next to you, introduce yourself, and think about what is the question that you wished we'd answered that perhaps we didn't this evening. And if you do have a question, please feel free to write it down, either send it to us or leave it on one of the tables at the front, and then continue your conversation out in the Inamori Forum this evening. Thank you all so much for attending.